Hello, welcome to today's video where we're going to be looking at extrapulmonary TB. So this is the second part of another video which was only looking at pulmonary TB. Um, so in that one we looked at you know how the lungs will be affected. Uh, however, TB can also go to sites outside the lungs and that's what, we're, we, that's what we term extrapulmonary TB. So we'll begin by looking at the most common sites uh, initially. So the most common site where the TB can occur outside the lungs is lymph nodes. After that, you can get it in the pleura. Um, number three is going to be genital urinary tract. Um, after that, we're going to have bones and joints, primarily the vertebral column. Um, number five is going to be meninges. Um, peritoneum is another place where you can find it in the GI tract in general and the pericardium. So um, this list is in order of frequency. So again, most common would be lymph node and the least common would be the pericardium. Now, it used to be that extrapulmonary TB was very uncommon. However, now it has become more common and this is attributed to the um, HIV. So HIV has led to this drastic increase of um, extrapulmonary TB. So what we'll do is, um, let me show this in a diagram. So here's a diagram from Wikipedia. Um, and so you can see here, um, CNS is, can be affected, lymph nodes, uh, the actual pleura here, uh, disseminated when, when it shoots out through the, uh, you know, here we have the arch of aorta, goes throughout the whole body, disseminates bones and joints, specifically the vertebra and the genital urinary tract. So um, we'll, talk, we'll start with the most common, which is the lymphatics. So the lymphatics that um, is most commonly affected is going to be the cervical, uh, more specifically the posterior cervical lymph node. And this is generally a painless swelling. So a patient will have a swelling in their neck and uh, you know, it won't be painful because if it's painful, it's more likely some type of infection. Maybe they have some type of throat infection, laryngitis. Uh, however, if it's not painful, then you might want to be thinking TB. Um, and besides, actually, besides the posterior cervical lymph node, um, this is also very common in the supraclavicular lymph node. And when, it, you're, when it's found in the supraclavicular lymph node, it has a more specific name known as the scrofula. So uh, pay attention for that. Um, oftentimes, the lymph node can also have a fishless tract. That's not always there, but it can be there. And there might also be some caseous material formed. And remember, um, TB does lead to caseous necrosis uh, and that we discussed in the previous video. There are some important differential diagnoses that you need to keep in mind. Because this is a painless lymphadenopathy, um, this can also be a lymphoma or even a metastasis. So this is a very important differential diagnosis to keep in mind and you have to make sure you rule that out. Um, next we'll talk about number two on the list would be the pleural TB. Um, so pleural TB is, a, TB is the second most common. I mean, we'll put that there. This can be either caused a hypersensitivity reaction or a direct spread from the lung parenchyma into the, eventually the pleura. So what are some you know, findings that you'd find? Of course, because it's, uh, it's, gonna, you, it's in the pleura, you'll get dullness and you'll also get decreased breath sound. And so we know that these two findings are most commonly associated with uh, effusion. And so that's pretty much what they'll get when, uh, is pearl effusion. Um, and, and one third of cases will have this pleural effusion when, when they get the pleural TB. So if you get pleural effusion, what's generally the first step that you would do? Thoracocentesis. So you're going to actually try to uh, remove the fluid and then do some analysis. Um, initially, it's going to look like a straw colored uh, fluid, very high in protein, um, low in glucose, not completely gone, but just low glucose. Um, you'll also get uh, acidity, so low pH. Um, very more specifically, ADA and lysozyme will be positive. So that's kind of something that's more unique to TB. And finally, as you would expect, um, you know, your WBC would be high in those patients. Um, what you'd also want to do uh, when, when, you t when you take the fluid, um, you're going to want to do a microscopy, you know, acid fast uh, staining, and you want to see if uh, you can identify the uh, TB through a microscope. You could do a culture. Uh, culture is more sensitive, but however, it does take longer. And finally, you can do a biopsy of the actual pleura, and that should show that should show granulomas as well as the um, 
actual pathogen. So um, that's plural TB, you know, pretty much there. Number three, most common, is going to be the genital urinary tract. Um, this is seen um, about 10 to 15 percent of the cases. So um, you know, pr pretty prevalent, you could say. Um, now, the symptoms that these patients will have will be uh, localized symptoms, depending on where the actual uh, infection is. Um, so oftentimes they can have uh, dysuria if it's in the bladder or the tract, dysuria frequency, um, nocturia is also common, and hematuria. So depending on where it is, um, you can get uh, you know, different types of symptoms. Um, if it's up higher, I guess, in the tract, it eventually can lead to flank pain. Uh, however, if it does become asymptomatic, um, these will tend to be discovered only after there's severe kidney injuries. Um, and you know, we'll talk about you know, injuries such as our complications such as hydronephrosis and even stricture. So um, you know, sometimes having symptoms and getting the uh, early alert to some problem might actually be beneficial. Um, now, what kind of uh, laboratory would you work would you want to do? We can talk about that. Um, first, you want to do your analysis. Um, keep in mind um, that 90% of the time this would be abnormal, so you get like a 10% um, false positive, false negative. What will you find? You find pyuria, hematuria without bacteria. Now, having pyuria, sorry, py pyuria without bacteria, um, that's fairly uncommon. So, whenever you see pyuria without bacteria, you're going to want to be thinking uh, TB. And why is there no bacteria? Because the actual load of the mycobacterium is very low, um, you know, so you probably won't be able to uh, actually catch it. Um, you may also want to do an IV pyelography, um, you know, urinalysis, IV pyelography, CT and MRI. And you want to do this just to see if there's any deformities, um, you know, found within the urinary tract, uh, which can cause, which can be caused by uh, TB. Finally, you do want to do a urine culture just to see if you can find something. Um, and you want to get three morning urine samples and um, generally about 90% of the time, um, you should be able to get something there. Now, um, with regards to the reproductive tract, um, so male and female will obviously be different. Uh, male, you can get epididymitis, uh, epididymis uh, can get caused, um, you can get orchitis, and you can get prostatitis. Whereas in females, um, you're more looking for infections in the fallopian tube and endometrium. Um, and so generally what females, you know, the complications they can have is either infertility, um, they can prevent with, present with uh, pelvic pain and menstrual abnormality. So that's usually the symptoms that they'll have and you know, they'll present with. So uh, now that we've you know, done genital urinary, um, we can now move on to, um, so that's genital urinary. So now we can move on to, uh, let's do bones and joints. So bones and joints, um, we're primarily going to be looking at the vertebral column. And um, this is very unique uh, to TB, uh, and it actually has a specific name called POTS disease. So POTS disease is extrapulmonary TB that occurs in your vertebral column. And a very, you know, it's very, you know, back pain is very common, many different reasons to have it. When it's specific to TB, um, you'll get tenderness um, in the area of infection. So that's a very, very important sign. And X-ray CT generally has a very classic uh, type of image there. So that's going to be bones and joints. Now we want to move over to meningitis, which is the fifth most common uh, location of uh, TB. So um, this is very common in children and HIV patients. Um, what symptoms will they have? Well, they're going to have headaches. They'll start off with headaches and mental changes. Then after a while, as it progresses, uh, they'll start to get some type of confusion. Uh, lethargy is, you know, they're just tired. Um, and they even present with, uh, may, may have neck rigidity eventually. Um, on top of all that, they may even have an underlying fever and malaise. Now, um, it does tend to affect the base of the brain. And so when it does that, um, you tend to get cranial nerve palsies. More specifically, you can get the oculomotor nerve palsy is when they look down and out and they have um, you know, the lid kind of lowered. Um, in the base of the brain, you can also have the, you also have the cerebral arteries that kind of move up. And so this can lead to uh, ische ischemia and a uh, type of stroke there. So what happens, these patients will get coma, that can lead to hydrocephalus, and that's of course due to uh, intracranial hypertension. And finally, this can be a cause of death. So this is something uh, we do want to treat and try to 
avoid as much as possible. So patient with meningitis, TB meningitis, what kind of lab work will you want to do? Well, first we want to do a spinal tap, get the CSF. Uh, you'll notice it's going to be high in leukocyte, low in glucose, and high in protein. So pretty much similar to the uh, previous one, the plural that we were talking about. You also want to do a CSF smear, and again, you're looking over there for uh, acid fast bacilli. One third will be caught. Um, however, if you repeat it, um, that increases the yield, so oftentimes it's repeated. Um, culture, this is probably the best. It's going to be about 80% catch, and so that's considered the gold standard, so definitely want to do culture. Um, PCR also has a very high sensitivity, 80% uh, sensitivity. However, it's limited because it has a 10% false positive. So um, you know, you don't want to be treating someone if they don't really have the actual condition. So uh, that's the kind of drawback on that. And um, you want to do CT and MRI, and that's going to just to kind of help look at the uh, any evidence of hydrocephalus. So that's another thing to look at. So we did lab work. So how would you treat it? So of course, with all of these, you treat with your chemotherapy of the uh, ERP. So ERP stands for isoniazid, rifampin, uh, pyrazinamide, and butyl. However, uh, glucocorticoids have also kind of shown to help. So then that, that might be a good choice uh, as well. So now we can move up to the sixth most common site, which is the gastrointestinal. Um, so how does it get into the actual GIT? Um, either it can be through coughing up and swallowing, um, it can go through the blood, the hematogenous system, and finally it can also be caught through cow's milk actually. And that's a specific strain called Mycobacterium bovine. Um, the most common site is going to be the terminal ileum and cecum, um, so that's going to be in the right lower quadrant. So what symptoms? Of course, you're going to get abdominal pain. Um, so the important differentiate, differential diagnosis is going to be appendicitis, because again, they both kind of occur in the same area, which is the uh, terminal ileum and cecum. So uh, right lower quadrant, one differential diagnosis is going to be uh, TB, extrapulmonary TB. Um, besides abdominal pain, you can get swelling. Um, obstruction, which can also occur, which leads to dilation, uh, hematochesia, which is going to be blood in the feces, and um, oftentimes felt as a palpable mass. And behind that, you will get a fever, night sweats, and malaise. So that's going to be um, something to look for as well. You want to make sure that you know they have the fever, night sweats before you become suspicious of uh, TB. Um, peritonitis can also occur. Um, again, how does it get there? Um, a ruptured lymph node oftentimes can go rupture into the peritoneum. Uh, it can go hematogenous route, and of course, it can it can go from direct extension from an intra-abdominal organ. So uh, that's going to be your uh, how you get peritonitis. Symptoms they they generally have diffuse pain, and it can lead to ascites because of the inflammation. So those are your two main symptoms. Paracentesis again, it's the same thing that you see before. You kind of see an exudative high protein uh, type of fluid, and of course you would expect to have um, high white blood cell count. So that's gonna be the important findings there. So finally, we'll just talk about some other forms uh, where it can be found. So this is gonna be in the pericardium. Um, I, you can have chorioretinitis, uh, uveitis, and even you can get panophthalmitis. So those are kind of the three findings there. Um, next, we can talk about the ear. It can go to the ear, uh, which can be tempo, tempo Panic mimic perforation, which can lead to hearing loss. Um, you can get cutaneous symptoms as well as mastitis. Uh, it can af affect above the kidneys the adrenal um, medulla, so the uh, adrenal gland, so adrenal insufficiency, and you can get congenital TB where it crosses transplacentally. So I'm, heard, I'm sure after you know going through this video, uh, you can appreciate um, uh, how vast um, kind of findings you can get with TB. They pretty much cover uh, everything there is, all the organs, all the body parts. So that's something to keep in mind when you're talking about TB is that it can come up in any part of the body, not only the lungs. So hope you enjoyed the video. Um, check out, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks.